Hello there, everyone, and welcome to The Bible Study. We are a multicultural group of believers that serve and emulate the Lord Jesus Christ. Now come with us as we go step by step on this journey through the Word of God in order to study and show ourselves approved, rightfully dividing the Word of Truth. We now join in with today's session. Okay. We're ready to uh, start today's uh, Bible study, and I want to personally, uh, on behalf of myself and the entire Bible study, I'm Pastor T. Archard Scott, and I just want to welcome all of you. I'll say a little bit more just shortly, but what we're going to do, we're going to open up with a word of prayer by Sister Shade, and then we're going to have our welcome, uh, none other than by Sister Tanya. All right. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for waking us all up this morning. Um, I just pray that we're all ready and hungry for the word. Um, I just pray that we just open our ears to be able to hear um, what Pastor Scott has to teach us today. Um, I just pray that you just speak through him. Um, allow us to understand, you know, exactly and directly what you're trying to um, help us with in our lives. Um, Lord, I just pray that you just give us better understanding of all the spiritual battles that we do face each and every day. Um, I just pray throughout this week that we just um, go back to the Bible study, rewatch it, take notes, um, stay encouraged in your word. I just thank you in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 All right. We'll have our, our welcome at this time by Sister Tanya Marie Scott. How about you unmute yourself? There you go. Okay, I thought we were still unmuted. <laughs> Sorry. Hello, everyone. I am Sister Tanya Scott. Um, you all have no idea how we or how excited we are to have you all here with us today. This week's message um, is again on spiritual warfare. So if you missed part one, this is part two. Please make sure that you um, check out part one from last week if you did miss it. Um, this week, part two is uh, a return to eat it. Also, we have an amazing Facebook group that we would love for you to be involved in if you haven't joined yet. Um, we want to get you added. This is where we review the lesson as well as provide a memory verse for the week. Um, so you definitely don't want to miss out on that. Uh, you can um, contact me um, on Facebook Messenger. So Tanya Marie Scott and I will get you added in the group. Um, so feel free to just reach out. I would love to meet you anyway if I haven't yet. And I just want to thank you all for being here today. All right. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So we do really uh, want you all to know we really appreciate it. Here's some special names. Not that everybody's name's not special. And if I overlook someone, please forgive me because I haven't tried to. We have uh, Sister Cheryl uh, Geeson. We have Sister Jeannie, Sister Monique, Sister Talisha, Sister Kinsey, and Brother Terry. So I just want to just take the opportunity to thank all of you uh, for being a part of our Bible study today. Uh, prayerfully, God will meet you right where you are. And whatever that is that the Lord really wants to speak to your heart, I would say to you, just embrace it and realize God has a word for all of us. And uh, if we'll take in the word of God, we will be blessed of the Lord. So I have another special, special, special treat today. I'm telling you, back by popular demand, I have a dear friend who is none other than our songbird himself. It's none other than Mary Catherine, and she's going to render another beautiful selection. Not only does she ride bikes thousands of miles, but she also can sing so that the birds themselves take here to what she says. So here she is, none other than Sister Mary Catherine. Got to unmute, not unmuted yet. There we go. There you go. When you find yourself alone, what choice are you gonna make? This song provides an answer. Mm, that's about a default. When I am alone, 
Lord, when I am alone. Oh, when I am alone, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all the rest. Give me Jesus. Oh, when I come to die, Lord, when I come to die, oh, when I come to die, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Wonderful, Amen. wonderful, wonderful. Amen. For God, for God, God is the glory. For God is the glory. Amen. You better believe that. <laughs> Absolutely. In all that we do, the Bible says we should do it to the glory of God. And how better to start out with a beautiful welcome, a beautiful prayer, and then followed by a beautiful sermonic psalm by none other than our sister, Mary Catterton. I will say this to you all. If we'll take clear listening to what the song said, when I am alone, give me Jesus. If you notice today, we have a title, which is our part two to spiritual warfare. But the subtitle is the part that really I wanted to home in on, and that is a return to Eden. Sometimes we can read stories out of the Bible and go through it and just say, you know what, I understand this. I've heard it a thousand times and I know the story about the fall of mankind. I know how Eve was tempted by the devil and what things took place. But don't you know, sometimes God has a way of taking what you thought you knew and showing you there was more to that than what meets the eye. So, here today, I'm going to be talking about, like I said, spiritual warfare, utilizing the story about what happened in the garden. And one of the things that uh, we really try to home in on also is having a memory verse. Uh, today, uh, I'd like to, uh, how we have uh, Minister Emmanuel. How about you say today's memory verse so that we can hear today's memory verse? And if he doesn't say it right, I'm going to have every one of the ministers write it a hundred times. <laughs> so it's Ooh. all hinged on him. <laughs> okay. The minister. Oh. I can, I can oh. hear you. Oh. Okay. Um, Matthew 28, 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I will be with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. 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 Very good. Very good. You spared everybody. All right. It is important that we realize, and as Sister Mary mentioned about being alone, also in Minister Emmanuel's uh, verse and quoting on the scripture, 28 and 20, which said that God said he would not leave us. In other words, he would not leave us alone. We find in this story where we're going to talk about with dealing with uh, Eve in the garden having this conversation with Satan, she was alone there. Adam was not there with her. And it is important that we realize we've got to have understanding of God's word. As you notice, Minister Emmanuel gave the memory verse. And it is so important that we realize and remember the word of God because that is what's going to keep us. Our words alone do not make the devil back up. Our words alone do not make anything for God move. The only thing that will move the enemy is the word of God. And we have to commit the word of God to memory. And if we will do that, we will do much better. 
few scriptures just real quickly, and I'll have you turn in a minute, but these you won't have to uh, turn to because they're just scriptures that are coming to my mind. And one of them uh, is we have to guide, we have to hide God's word in our heart that we might not sin against him. That is in Psalms 119 and 11. The thing is how we hide God's word in our heart. We've got to memorize it. We've got to go over it. And here we're going to see the importance of it. So also in the teaching today, I'm going to also talk a little bit about the body, our soul, and our spirit. God created us as a triune person. And as a triune person, we have a physical body, just like here, a physical body. Inside that physical body, we have what's called our soul. That is that part that deals with our psyche or psychological. Then we also have our spirit. That spirit is the life of God. As you do remember in the Bible, the Bible says in the second chapter of Genesis that God breathed the breath of life into man. The breath of life into man culminate making that man come to life, but also gave him a spirit. The spirit of that man it's the part that God communicates with. And God wants us to have our spirit holy toward him. So let me deal with some of the faculties of the body, the soul, and then the spirit. So when I, st when I start talking about this situation of what happened with Eve in the garden, we'll understand how the enemy was actually tempting her and why we entitled this spiritual warfare. So... Our actual physical body makes us keenly aware to our physical surroundings. We have five parts that we have that work to do that. One is our sight, what we see. That's one of our senses in our physical body, how we see things that are physical. Then we also have our taste, what we taste with our mouth. We also have our hearing, what we hear with our ears. We also have uh, not only that, what we touch, in other words, what we feel, and then also what we smell, the actual aroma, whether it's an odor or whether it's something sweet smelling. Those are the five senses of our body. So our body works is strictly working on the outside of us so that we can tell us when it's cold outside, when it's hot, how we're feeling with things we touch, whether it's rough or it's smooth whether we're hearing a certain thing, whether it's a loud sound or if it was something distinct that said, these are things that are very important because this is what our physical body does. Next thing we have is our soul. The soul, which I identified as being our psyche or our psychological side, there are several components in our soul. One of those components are our thoughts, our will our imagination, some of the other things we have, our reasoning, our feelings, our memory, our affections. These are things that are in our actual soul. And that's why it is so important. The Bible identifies the soul as being the heart or the actual center of that person. Our soul is that place where we do a lot of our reasonings and thinking out. It is our thinking. And how we think, it, it, it is ill-determined what we do. So that's very important. Then we have our spirit, which is the breath of life that God gave us. Our spirit is that part of us that makes us keenly aware to the things of God. Now, when Adam and Eve were created, they were created with a spirit that was open to God. There was no hindrances. They talked directly to God and God spoke to them directly by their spirit. At that time, their spirit was in control of the body. It was in control of their mind, or as we call it, the soul. The actual spirit of God that was in them, the spirit that was in them, actually had control, so there was no hindrances. And the reason I want to explain these three things is because when I start talking about this actual story about what happened in the garden, what happened in Eden, 
you'll be able to get a clearer understanding of the temptation that Eve went through so that you'll be able to understand also what your temptations are and what your shortcomings may be if you don't do things the way God wants. And then also the reason why we need the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is different than our spirit, two different spirits. So I'm ready to get into this now. All right, so let's turn our Bible to the book of Genesis, first book in the Bible. We're going to be at chapter number three. Let me give you a set up a little scenario so you'll know what's taking place at this time. God has created all things, the heavens, the earth, not only that, the oceans, the waters, the stars, the solar system, and he also created the earth. On the earth, he had created all these things, the fish and the animals and the, the plantation and everything of the plants, of everything that were planted. So what happens is God then tells Adam and Eve, he tells Adam mainly, I've given you dominion over all the fish of the uh, earth, all the birds, all the animals, all the land, over everything. So Adam was a very complex person. He was not just a regular person created and did not have this advanced mind. Adam had a very clear mind, and everything that God told him, he retained it. So he had a mind where he was retaining everything that God said do. When God noticed that he was lonely, God said, I'm going to make woman. As it's, everybody knows, he took one of, he put Adam into a sleep and he took one of Adam's ribs and created a woman to be a help meet for Adam so he would not be lonely either at that time. So now here's Adam and Eve and the Bible says God put them in the garden. And God told Adam, because this was before Eve was created, he told Adam, all of these trees, all of these fruit, everything in the garden, you can eat of any of them, bearing fruit, any of them. It's just this one tree I don't want you to eat of. And that is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I don't want you to eat of that because if you eat of that, this is in the second chapter of Genesis, I believe verse number seven. If you eat of that, you shall surely die, God told him. And Adam, his responsibility, since he had dominion over everything on earth, especially over that area there, he told Eve also what God said. So now Eden is a garden that God himself created and put Adam and Eve in a beautiful garden. Now, according to where the Bible says, this place of Edom would be where we are. We have located currently now the area in the Middle East, which is about and around Iraq. That's in the actual area because in the Bible, it says this is a place where some of these rivers, like the Euphrates River and some of these other rivers that went through that part of the Euphrates and also the Tigris River went through those parts. And that's in that area of Iraq, just so for history's sake you'll get a chance to understand that. So this place was beautiful. And here it was flourishing because there had been no death of anything on earth. It flourished. It was simply beautiful. And God said that even, even though it's so beautiful, in the midst I have this one tree and I don't want you to eat of that. When we pick up in the third chapter, which I'm gonna start reading right now and explaining, this is where Eve is in the garden now, uh, the Garden of Eden, and she's having this conversation. As we learned last week, when Satan or when Lucifer, as his name was from the beginning, he was an archangel. God had created him more beautiful than all of the other angels. And we found out through the word of God last week that Lucifer was responsible for a third of the heavens. He was also responsible for all the third of all the angels. He had command over all of them. And when he looked unto himself and saw how beautiful he was and how great he was, he then became exalted. This is one of the things we have to really watch out for 
is when God is using us or God does something special in our life, we can't allow ourselves to get exalted because if we allow ourselves to get exalted, God will not be able to use us and we will lose what we had from God. That's important to know. So when Satan saw how beautiful he was and how, how much authority he had, he then rebelled. And when he rebelled, he desired to make his own kingdom, even in the kingdom of heaven. And the Bible says on the northern skies of heaven. But we found out when he rebelled, uh, let me ask real quick, Sister Shade, what happened to Satan when he rebelled against God that tried to take over heaven? He threw him out of heaven, threw him down to earth, kicked him he, out. He kicked him out of heaven and threw him down to earth. So it, if you ever want to know how did the devil get here, that's how he got here. And the planet Earth is just one out of millions and millions of planets. And just think, Lucifer was over a third of all those planets also and was kicked down here to Earth. Not only was he removed to Earth, but all the angels that were with him, even though we don't know the amount of angels. But let me ask this question here. Uh, let's see. How about Sister... How about Sister Amanda? Do you remember how much, uh, what percentage that Satan was over of the angels? Was it half? Was it a third of them? Or a third? It was a third. Absolutely. See, I, I'm asking these questions to all my Bible scholars because they know these answers. Been knowing it probably for years. It was a third of heaven. He was over a third of the angels. And he literally lost his actual position that fast. Sister Mary, that's my other scholar here. Sister Mary, do you remember what Jesus said about how he saw Satan fall from light? I mean, fall from heaven. How was it? Uh, he fell as lightning from the sky. As light <laughs> <laughs> he <laughs> fell as lightning from the sky. And I quote, that fast. Jesus said he was there and saw Satan fall like lightning. And let me just say this to you as a side note. If there is anything in your life that you can't handle, I want you to know God is bigger and better and able to handle it just like that. As Sister Mary just said, fell like lightning just like that. So it will behoove us when we have issues in our life, take it to Jesus. I believe that's what the song that she sang also said. Take it to Jesus when you're feeling alone or you're feeling like you don't have strength or you're feeling like you can't, you don't know how to answer certain things in your life when you're complex about this pandemic or any of the things that are in your life, take it to Jesus. Don't try to handle it yourself. So Satan was kicked out of heaven and a third of his angels, when he was kicked out of heaven, he lost his actual authority and he lost his beauty and he lost his name of Lucifer, which was star in the morning. And now he became Satan, the ruler of all darkness. He became a demonic leader. All of the angels, they lost all of their power and position also they became demons and evil spirits. So if people ask the question, where did demons come from? These demons were at one time angels, but they followed Satan and they were all removed and kicked out of heaven to this place called earth. Not only that, but God not only took their authority, he took their physical bodies from them. They no longer had a physical body where they could look at, like Satan looked on himself and saw all the beautiful, according to Isaiah 14, he saw all the beautiful makings and the beautiful stones of God that were in him, and he was excited about that. But now he doesn't have a physical body to look upon. And same thing with these angels. So now they are disembodied, meaning they have no physical body, so they have to inhabit or come into a physical body in order to have accomplished their works. 
how we can see demons physically with our physical eyes is we watch the actions of others. And when others do things contrary to the word of God, that's how we can tell what demon or what spirit is affecting them. If they do the things of God, we can pretty much say, you know what? They probably are a child of God. But if they're doing evil and ungodly things, and you should know in Galatians, the fifth chapter, it talks about the works of the flesh. And those are the whole list that they give for the works of the flesh are right there in Galatians, the fifth chapter. I believe it starts at verse 17. And believe me, it is horrendous, the things that are in this body. So I said all that to show you why Satan is so angry and he's so mad at anyone or anything that represents God because he lost all that he had. And he realized very quickly, as Sister Mary said again, very quickly that he lost all of his authority in heaven. And so now anyone that represents God, he's after you. Anyone that represents God, that's the person, the people that he's after. And so let's go into this. So now you get a chance to see what's going on and why Satan wants to take advantage of Eve. In the very uh, third chapter of Genesis is where I'm at right now. I'm going to begin reading from verse number one, and we'll go into that. Now the serpent, and when it says now the serpent, that is because now Satan what he has done, he's utilizing this body of this serpent. So you know, uh, spirits can also inhabit animals as well as people. So you'll know. Okay, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Look at this. The serpent was already more subtle. And when you find anyone who is really subtle, the enemy likes that about these people or these things because subtle people are very clever. They're very conniving. They're very uh, elusive. You know, think about it. Uh, subtle people, people that are, are, are just, they mean bad. They don't mean good at all, but they know how to be persuasive. They know how to manipulate. If you are around people that manipulate, are so persuasive, they are very cunning, they're very deceitful, I want you to know for a surety that is not the spirit of God. And they don't have the spirit of God in them because the spirit of God would never do those type of things, ever. So, if you notice also, Satan knew the right species to pick. If there was just something that was really just, you know, something that was very nice, a little cat, a little kitten, no, a little dog. I know that some of you all have nice little pets and everything. And the dog, oh, ruff, 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 ruff. no. Satan needs something to be able to be as very elusive that can blend into everything. Have you ever seen people, it looks like they just, they just like, they just say and do anything to get along with everybody, even if they contradict themselves. That's called subtle. Let me continue. The Bible says, and he said unto the woman, yea, has God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now notice this. You have to be uh, understand in our English language to even start out a sentence like this, there had to be a previous conversation. You don't start out, uh, yay, half God said, wait a second. That wouldn't even make sense to me. I'm coming down the street and someone says, hey, now did so-and-so say that? What conversation did we have? So there probably was a conversation that was going on because if you think about it, if God said out of all the trees, I don't want you to eat of this tree here, 
what in the world would you be doing around the one tree that God says, don't even eat of it? Out of all these other trees, out of all the places in the garden, here Eve is outside that one tree. And like I told you, the garden was a large area. It wasn't just like, oh, it's a little backyard. And then, hey, you know, there's a tree right there. And that, no, there were several trees. And she's by this, this tree. And the serpent is now talking to her. He's going to appeal to three of her senses. And this is what the Bible says, because it's very important that we understand this. In uh, the book of 1 John 2 and 16, the Bible says, for there are three things that are in this world, or for all that is in the world is lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Lust of the flesh, something that's going to be appealing to your body. Lust of the eyes, uh, lust of the um, and pride of life, something that's going to make you feel uh, uplifted. The enemy is always trying to find ways to pull us in. And let me say this to you as a side note, and I'll go right back into the story. The enemy always, Satan always utilizes something that, first of all, is appealing to your flesh. Always. It's going to be something that he'll use that'll be naturally uh, that you're attracted to. And he is observing us. He has his demons to observe us and what we do. So don't ever think that uh, the enemy doesn't observe you. Anyone knows in, in, uh, in, in uh, tactics of war, we always the enemy always uses something to observe what's going on in your life. And then he observes how you handle it and what things you say. Uh, for those of you who didn't know, uh, I was in the Air Force. And so my job in the Air Force, I was a historian. So I would write on the, the wars that we were involved with and the conflicts that we were involved with, with any wars that were going on. So Middle East, Granada Invasion, Desert Storm, Desert Shield, you're talking to the person who wrote the books on it. That was me. And those books are kept so that they can look back and un understand how these wars got started, what things were done, and what things and what weapons were used. Well, in the same token, the enemy always studies the people. He always studies and he looks at where your weaknesses are, things that you may be vulnerable to. And as I mentioned earlier today, that's why it is so important that we learn what the word of God says and commit it to memory because it's very important. Now you're going to see why, as I begin reading some more, why it was important to commit the word of God to memory and not miss what it says. Verse number two says here, it says, and the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. God never said you couldn't touch it. He said you can't eat of it. And that sparked the enemy's interest. When he sees that we don't understand what the word of God says, when we don't understand how to quote that scripture, when we don't have the word of God sown in our life, and when we do have a conversation with the enemy, he, he's got you. He's got you. He knows he sparked your interest. We should know anything that is trying to pull you down, anything that's trying to contradict the word of God, anything that is trying to bring hurt, harm, or shame in your life against God is of the devil. And all the devil needed, all Satan needed was to know that Eve was interested in his conversation. Interested. Now that he has her interested, he knows the word of God just like she does because least, least we forget, he was already cast down to earth even before Adam and Eve. He was here. He saw, he heard what God told Adam. And notice this, he, he knew that Adam was there, but Eve wasn't at that time, she wasn't created. 
So when Adam gave that information to Eve, the serpent is trying to find out what is it that she lacks? What is it that she really wants that she feels like she's not being able to get? Let me put my little Bible right here on the side real quick. About to get real good. And the enemy wants to know, what is it that you really want outside of God? Because there are things about God that we as human beings, sometimes we contradict. We don't really want to do. You know, have you thought about it? Do we really want to live a life like Jesus? Everything. Praying, fasting, seeking the Lord, doing these other things. Because those things won't appeal to the flesh. Those things won't appeal to our body, things that we want to do. And a lot of it doesn't appeal to our mind because our mind a lot of times wants to do its own thing. When God created Adam and Eve, he gave them a free will. In other words, he allowed them the decision to make what was right or wrong in their life so that they could never blame God and say, you made us this way. God did not use robotics on humans. And when I say robotics, I mean to make us make a choice. No, he actually gave us free will to make a choice, whether we want to serve God or not serve God. And just think about it. How important is it? Here's a question I want to ask. Uh, Mr. Dion, how important is it that God gave us free will so that he's not making our choice? How important is it? Um, it's very important because of the fact that, um, you know, with us having this free will, we can take heed unto ourselves and, and, you know, of ourselves as in our flesh, which is of the devil, or we can follow God. So if somebody's truly following God, uh, God can see it by their heart and that free will of them, you know, not taking heed unto themselves, but them taking heed unto God. Very good. Very good. It's important that God's given us free our free will, because without free will to do those things that are uh, our, our choice, it is hard. Let me just say this to you. It's hard to know if a person really loves you if they don't have a choice. If they don't have a choice, it's hard to, if I have to do a certain thing, how will we really know? And then if there's no choice of more than just one thing like you, then, hey, I I, I really can't show my true love. God is allowing Adam and Eve to show their true love by their obedience. Jesus said it like this. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And this is how we show our love for God. But it's important that we have that choice. We have a, 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 a Elder Brian Barrett. Elder Brian Barrett, if the Lord did not give us choice, what kind of people would we be? We would probably be like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, yeah. uh, governed by laws that we couldn't keep. Mm -hmm. Very good. And we'd be hypocrites. I, there's one thing I tell you God dislikes. He dislikes hypocrites because hypocrites will say one thing and do another. They'll say one thing. They live by this creed like, don't do as I say do. I mean, don't do as I do, do like I say do. And that's a hypocrite. God says it like this, be ye doers of the word and not just hearers only, deceiving yourself. It is important that we do the word of God, but if we don't know the word of God, uh, Sister Angel Barrett, since you're right there, if we don't know the word of God, how will we fulfill the word of God? Where is the problem if we don't know the word of God? We won't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, we have won't. no, we we'll have nothing to govern, us, govern ourselves by. We'll have nothing to govern ourselves by. Very good. Thank you so much. We'll not be able to govern ourselves. And how will you know if you're pleasing to God? Um, uh, minister, uh, or actually, uh, um, uh, Sister Williams, Minister Williams, uh, let me ask you this question. If there was no word of God, how would we know if we're pleasing to God? We wouldn't, 
and we will be left to our own desires, mm -hmm. what looks right to us. Very good. Absolutely. And that's what we would do. It, you know, the saying in the world, if it feels good, finish that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do, it. do it. Right. right. <laughs> and let me say thank you so much for sharing. And that is what the world said. If it feels good, then it's got to be God. But I'm gonna say I'll say this to you all, and some of you all who've been around probably as, as the the few years that I've been around, don't let the gray fool you. <laughs> but listen, we've learned that there are certain things that may feel good to you, but ultimately, that is, even though it may feel good, if it contradicts the word of God, it's not God. The Bible says it like this: sin is fun for a season. But as James identifies, sin will bring forth, eventually it will bring forth death. And here, now remember also, now Adam and Eve had never experienced death. So I give them that. They never had experienced death. But even though they didn't experience death, that doesn't mean that they had to try out God to see if they would really die. I mean, I never experienced jumping in a fire and getting burnt in a fire, but I'm not in a rush to jump in that fire to see if I can get burnt. No. So here's the thing. Here Eve is having this conversation, and now she's going back and forth with the devil. And the very first thing he's doing, he's appealing to her about what she sees, because she sees this fruit. She sees, and not only does she see this fruit, but now he's going to go from the fruit into what's appealing to her mind. Let me go ahead and read a little bit more so you'll get a chance to see and hear what I'm talking about. I'm just gonna read this verse number two, one more time, two and three. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God have said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Verse four. This is what Satan says. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. That's not going to happen. Die, what? Oh, have you not had people that are trying to manipulate you and they're trying to deceive you out of what you already know is true and they have to always come as a friend. They have to always come as somebody you can trust. And then not only are they going to come as somebody you can trust, they're coming as an authority. And if you listen to them, whoever or whatever was your authority, you reduce that in their sight and in your own. And listen to the serpent, serpent now. He says here, I'll read it again. He shall not eat. I mean, excuse me. Uh, he did. And the serpent said unto, unto the woman, he shall not surely die. For God does know that in that day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. He's appealing to her through her soul, through her mind, through her desires, through her will, that listen, God already knows that if you eat of this, you're not going to die. You believe that? Come on. You're not going to die. He just knows that. Now, notice this. This serpent is trying to give her information that God never even gave her. And this is what happens with a lot of people. They start adding to the word of God what God never said. And once they start adding to the Bible what God never said, it's so that he could actually lure them away. To lure away is to take an object and to take it as something that's appealing to you and get you so focused on that object that the attack that's getting ready to come your way, you won't be ready for it. You won't be prepared for it. And listen, I'll say this to you all. The enemy is always eyeing the people of God, always. He's always trying to find some way that he can infiltrate your mind and tell you something against God subtly. 
the, the, the enemy was smooth. He was very subtle. There's a scripture that says, be wise as a serpent, yet harmless as a dove. This serpent is wise. He's using wisdom. He's appealing to their senses. And as he's appealing to their senses, and I told you the three ways he attempts us, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and pride of life, those are all. He will use one of them or all of them to be able to tempt us and lure us away from God. Let's see what Eve does now. Verse number five. For God does know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And verse six, and when the woman saw the tree, she looked at it with her natural eyes. It was good for food. The food looked beautiful. And that it was pleasant to the eyes. He's dealing with the body. And the tree, excuse me, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, where's the wisdom? In the mind, he's, he's appealing to all of our senses. She took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave un, also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Let me just say this real, real quick. I'm gonna go right into it. I'll pick up the verse seven, eight again. She ate of the fruit because she allowed herself to be convinced that what the enemy, what the devil was saying was true. But let me tell you also what is there that she's saying also, that God lied to her. She is saying by her actions that God lied, that there's a flaw in the word of God because God told them that's his word when he speaks it. He told them this and that he lied. And notice this, after she finishes, in her mind, she's noticing she doesn't see a physical death. She doesn't see it. But, she's, but she is experiencing something different now. I want you to know that there is an experience, because the Bible said, as I mentioned earlier, sin is fun for a season. She's now experiencing... My eyes are open. You know, I really, have you ever, now all of us have, but I'll ask this question as if we don't know. Have you ever, you ever recall when you were once a sinner, the things you did? See, what happens to a lot of us is we've been so far removed. We've been saved so long. We act like we never were sinners. Who, me? Uh, oh, I would never, my God, no, I, me, I, I don't, I don't, li listen, I'm gonna tell you, I don't smoke, drink, lie, curse, steal, I don't do any of that, no, I don't see, oh, it's so ugly, I can't believe people would do that, <laughs> as the Bible says, and so were some of you, so was I, because I was a sinner, my whole life was at a point where I was cut off from God because at this very moment when Adam and Eve ate of that fruit, God immediately shut their spirit off so that they could no longer commune directly with God. Because if Satan had taken control of their spirit, man would never bring about a savior. He cut their spirit off. They had their body still, they had their mind still, but their spirit was shut off with God so that they had to communicate to please God with offerings and sacrifices. The Bible says obedience is better than sacrifice. But because they were disobedient, they now lost that part of them that kept them obedient, which is that spirit of them that got cut off. That spirit is still alive. Don't get me wrong. They still have a spirit, but they can't communicate with God. They can't be able to have that openness with God because they now had this enemy infiltrate them, which is Satan. And that's what makes a sinner a sinner, that they don't have communication with God. That's why they have to then allow their mind to rule 
what they think, what they'll do, what they desire, what they, uh, you know, their, their whole thoughts, their will, all these things, their imagination. That's why they do all these type of things. And think of this like this. Your spirit at the time before the fall of man, before they fell into sin, your spirit was like the king. And he would tell your soul, which is your mind, who was like the uh, the actual, he was like the, the, he was like the, let me say the foreman. He was responsible for making sure that your body, which was like the servant, did what it's supposed to do. The king would say, this is what I want to happen. That, that is your spirit. He would speak that to your mind and your mind would say, okay, I'll make sure the body does it. And he would speak that to the actual body. Now with the spirit being cut off, now with there not being that type of relationship with God, now because it was cut off, now there's a problem there. And the problem there is that now your mind is what is in control. And any ungodly person, any person that does not have the spirit of God in them, the Bible says, if the spirit of God dwells not in you, you are none of his. You're a sinner. And sinners always try to think whatever it is they want to do and tell the body what to do. The problem is this, the, the actual mind, our mind without having God in us and without having the leading of the Holy Spirit in us, our mind is only gonna tell this body whatever it go, does, it wants to feel or whatever it wants it to do, it wants it to do it and it'll always be against God. This is why it is so important for us as believers and how we became believers, we accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as our savior. We accepted that Jesus actually did come and die for our sins. And because he died for our sins, once we believe that, then the Holy Spirit came into our spirit that was dormant, had no strength. The Holy Spirit came into our spirit and now strengthen our spirit so now we can fight against this actual flesh because our flesh, which is our body, wants to do its own thing. Here's the flesh, here's the actual, here's the actual spirit. And we as a saved believers, we have the spirit of God dwelling in our spirit, which now gives us the right, the authority to convince the mind. Here's the mind here in the middle. You got the spirit of God here, You've got your flesh over here, your body, and your mind. And whoever convinces the mind the most, the body will follow. Whoever convinces the mind the most, whoever influences the mind the most, the actual body is going to follow. And the body is stubborn because it's called the flesh. And the Bible said the carnal mind, well, in other words, this, this physical body, this body has its own mind. Let me just say this. You don't even have, let me tell you how this, watch this. This body is a magnet to sin. It will find, if you let this body go on its own, it will find a way to sin by itself. It is always attracted to sin. It's always attracted to ungodliness. It's always attracted to whatever makes itself look good. It's always attracted to it. But it fights and wars against the spirit of God, which is in us. And what it does is it tries to keep itself strong. But remember now, the soul, which is the mind, that is the part we got to convince. Well, how are we going to convince this mind to follow the things of God if we don't get and let this mind be in us, which was in Christ Jesus, by getting in the word and getting the word in us? That's where the problem is. If you do not feed your mind, think of it like feeding. If you, whatever you feed your mind, that's what it's going to eat. One thing about the mind, our actual mind, it is an equal opportunist. Whoever and whatever you feed, that's what it's going to eat. If you feed it fleshy things, things of the world, things that are ungodly, it's going to eat it. 
And that's how it's going to think. If you feed it things that are of God, things that are that are wholesome, things that are good. This is why the Bible says it like this. And uh, the scripture actually, I want to make sure I give it to you right. Scripture actually uh, says in Matthew 6 and 21, where your treasures are, that's where your heart is also. Wherever your treasures are, whatever that thing is that you love the most, that's where your actual heart, that's where your thoughts are going to be. That's where you're going to put it on to. Philippians 4 and 8 says that we should think on things that are true, that are honest, that are just, that are of good report, that are pure, that are lovely, that are virtuous. The Bible tells us these are things that we should think on. Why? Because if we'll think on these type of things, then what will happen is that's what will get in our mind. The reason why people are so corrupt and they do so many ungodly things is because of where they let their mind go, what they're feeding on. You cannot be around evil people and doing evil deeds and all they think of is problems, all they think of this situation and this ain't going to work out, that's not going to work out, I don't trust this, I don't know this thing about God, who says God? I mean, when you're around people like that, and then you have problems in your life and you start getting bombarded and all these problems after problem after problem, you are what you are in the middle of spiritual warfare and the enemy is trying to make your problems bigger than your God. I'll say that again. When you're being bombarded by the enemy with all these thoughts on doubt, worry, concern, hurt, harm, danger. It is because the enemy is trying to make your problem bigger than God. Because as I started my preface for today, I showed you that God, he actually dealt with the hugest, the largest problem in the universe, which was Lucifer taking over heaven. And he dealt with it just like that. Within a second's time, the war was over, Satan had lost and was kicked out of heaven and lost his power and lost his authority. And God is saying, if I can do that, your little problem that you deal with doesn't really mean nothing because I can deal with it just like that. But the question is, will you give it to God? Will you allow him to work it out versus you try to work it out? Because as long as you're trying to work it out and you're trying to handle everything by yourself, God gave you a free will. God's like, I'm not going to force myself on you, but it would behoove you if you would allow me to handle it. And if you don't allow God to handle it, God will be just like he did to the Pharisees and the scribes. He'll say, okay, physician, you think you can handle situation? Heal yourselves. You deal with it. So she brings this fruit and gives it to Adam. And the Bible says that Adam wasn't deceived. The serpent deceived Adam, but Adam was, I mean, it deceived Eve, but Adam's fall was by decision. Eve was by deception. Adam's fall was by decision. Here's the difference. To be deceived, someone used trickery and sleight of words or sleight of hand or sleight of uh, thoughts and deceived you into making this decision. When Adam saw Eve come back to him and say, look, Adam, look at this fruit. You can eat of this fruit. Adam knew that it was wrong. He knew that that was a deception. He also knew there was something different about Eve today. When a person takes on a different spirit, I want to say this to you all, there's something different about them. And this is why we've got to keep our guards up when it comes down to spiritual warfare. We've got to be able to trust God because when Adam ate of that fruit, they all fell into sin. And it did not, they did not realize death actually did come into the world but the death that came into the world came to their own child. Cain killed Abel. They had no idea that their actions formulated a mentality in their own children. And because it did, Cain, 
who wanted to do just like Satan did and get himself to be pleasing to God and that God should accept whatever he wanted. He didn't want to accept what God's ways were. He wound up killing his own brother, but it came from the sins of their forefathers. Something to be mindful of. So this is why we had to revisit Eden again and make sure that we're being mindful of our decisions and our actions. Because if we'll be mindful of our decisions and our actions, we'll realize that things that are in our life, the things you might do right now, you may not understand that they're going to be affecting generations to come out of your own family. So that's as far as I want to go today, because I'll say this to you next week. We're going to pick up on this thing where we're going to see a little bit more about this spiritual warfare. But I'm going to start showing you some of our weapons that we have that we can use against the enemy. And whatever he's trying to do in your life, you're going to have authority over it. You're not going to have to back down. Matter of fact, some of you are going to become warriors and start trying to track down the devil and, and put him in his place like God has wanted us to do from the start. But if you don't know the power and authority you have, you won't be able to use it. Next week, we're going to learn about the power and authority of the believer. So I do want to just say this to you all. Thank you all for tuning in with me today. All of you, I really do thank and praise God for you all. You all could have been anywhere, and I don't take that for granted. All the um, new people that joined in, I pray that you got something out of today's lesson and that God will convey that to you in the way that you understand. I will be uh, having this uh, message recorded so you'll be able to have a link and if you'd like to listen to it over again and look at some of the scriptures, by all means do that. And uh, I pray that God will give you a great increase. So without any further ado, I'm going to have uh, a closing prayer uh, real quick. And uh, with this closing prayer, I'm going to ask, how about we, Sister Jaden, you ready to pray today? All right, I'm going to have my friend, Sister Jaden, pray uh, because she prays sincerely, and I thank uh, God for her. Dear Father God, I just thank you for bringing everybody to this Bible study today to see how important it is to understand how, how easily we can be deceived, God. And um, I just ask that you work on everybody and um, just bring freedom to everybody's minds and just block those voices out of our minds that tell us that we cannot do things because we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And um, I just thank you for uh, just keeping everybody safe and healthy and protecting everybody from harm and all evil every day. Yes. And um, I just ask that you uh, take it into everybody's minds, how blessed yes. we are just to have everything that we have, God, thank because you. there are things that other people don't have that we do, yes. God. And um, I just ask that you bless everybody throughout this bless day and um, just make it a good day in you, Lord. Yes. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you all once again for uh, tuning in. Love you guys. Thank you all. And, and those of you who, who came out today, come again. I really do appreciate all of you all. And I'd like to get a chance to meet and know you all. So take care. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.